Thank you guys so much. It's such an honor to punctuate a beautiful evening with so many great speakers. I'm also, I just want to acknowledge how impressed I am with how you guys went all out for the decorations. And if I could offer a special thank you to the person who created this dragon, sort of exploding dragon TEDx moment over there. It's like where I want to start my talk. I'm slightly overwhelmed by uh, the daunting task of explaining and deconstructing systems of punishment and control like the prison industrial complex, mass incarceration, over-sentencing, wrongful convictions, and solitary confinement in less than six minutes. So I thought I would start off slow and introduce you guys to my grandmother. <clears throat> this is Carolina Bartomeo. She was born in Italy, but she spent most of her formative years in the immigrant communities of Queens, New York. Um, she was four foot eight. About 70% of her body weight was boobs. So she was this like amazing hugger and like incredibly mushy. <laughs> and she was as wise as she was mushy. Um, after I graduated college way back in the 1900s, I moved in with her. And some of my most sacred time was spent having tea with her after I would come home from work. And so I would arrive home, and um, she would always have the tea ready, and we'd sit down. She'd start off with the same questions. How was your day? What'd you have for lunch? Did you meet anyone special? When are you going to have a baby? <laughs> you're 23. You're getting old, Jackie. You know, start off like that. And then whatever banality happened in my day, she had this really incredible way of connecting it to her 80-plus years of wisdom. And on one day in particular, I remember complaining about my trek to work. We were in Howard Beach, and I would have to go all the way to the Upper East Side. So I would take the A train, which is pretty slow, all the way up to 86th Street, get out, cross over Central Park, and then take another train a few blocks up. And I was complaining about how tedious it was and how much time it took, and et cetera, et cetera. And she just looked at me, and she said, Jackie, why do you want to be so efficient? Why do you want to take the route that is the most efficient? Why don't you take the route that's the most beautiful? And I was like, oh, this is New York. I never thought about that. I didn't think about being or taking the most beautiful. I always thought taking the most efficient, being the fastest, being the best, et cetera. And she sort of went on to say, you should be suspicious of efficiency, right? That uh, inventions that were supposed to make us more efficient actually have begun to destroy us. The dishwasher, for instance, was meant to make the family unit much more efficient. And she argued that it destroyed the family unit. Because that time after dinner, when everyone was satisfied and fed, and they would come together, wash the dishes, dry the dishes, and then put them away, was the time when they got to really know each other, right? Really got to know the complexity of each other. It's 2015. We've become incredibly addicted to being efficient, right? We lust after efficiency. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on gadgets to make us more efficient. We communicate in what we think is the most efficient way using acronyms TTYL, WTF, SMH, right? And then sometimes we, we try to explain the inefficiencies of our emotions with little yellow faces, or sometimes like turds with googly eyes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which may seem harmless or even attractive in this world that strives to be so efficient. But when you project it on the backdrop of systems of power and control, the mechanism for maintaining that control is to conflate our identities, to conflate our emotions, and to conflate our experiences in order to establish otherness, in order to create an oversimplified and exclusionary binary system of thought and pattern. We have become so steeped in our desire to be efficient, we might not even notice how much we subconsciously participate in it, right? We conflate our everyday opinions into things like like and dislike, good and bad. The, we perpetuate the exclusionary gender binary as if there's only male and female. Our <coughs> politics participate on this binary. So much of our personal and cultural narratives exist only with the, on the spectrum of a binary. Hero versus villain. Good versus evil. Cowboys versus Indians. <laughs> That's a good one. We even skew the possibility, the complicated possibility of justice through a binary lens. 
expecting that we can somehow find and experience the abstraction of justice in just guilty or innocent. The one that I want to talk about and the one that I think is the most important is the us versus them binary. All systems of punishment and control rely on this binary, rely on reinforcing otherness, on conflating identities in times of war, taking the complexity of the American identity and conflating it into this highly nationalistic sense of who we are, right? I am American, therefore I am not Vietnamese, I am not Japanese, I am not Iraqi, I am not a terrorist, right? Reinforcing otherness. We, the United States, maintains 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prison population. We are the greatest incarcerator in the world. At any given moment, 8 million Americans are under some form of correctional control. 2.5 million Americans are incarcerated. 80,000 of them are in a six foot by nine foot cell indefinitely, in sol enduring solitary confinement. The mechanism for maintaining the largest prison population in the world is reinforcing otherness, right? Using terms like prisoner, convict, inmate, guilty, reducing the humanity of an individual to a number, prisoner 76759, prisoner 72148, 86848, etc. <clears throat> I spent the last 14 years of my life working with a man who once was prisoner 76748, Herman Wallace. He spent 41 years in a six foot by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed. He was released on October 1st, 2013. His conviction was overturned. And then he died on October 4th. 2013. How you gauge your reaction to this story should indicate how subconscious this binary patterning is, right? Whether or not you thought, wow, that is just tragic, therefore there's no space for the miracle, or whether or not you thought, wow, that's a miracle, he died free, and there's no space for the tragic, right? These things not only coexist, but they are interdependent. And I would argue that it is required that we unpack our emotions, we unpack our identity, we unpack who we think we are in order to explore and discover our humanity. And that if we really want to deconstruct systems of power and control, if we really want to deconstruct the prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex, the cultural industrial complex, then we have to be willing to celebrate the complex we have to be willing to celebrate the confounding, the inefficient, the inclusionary, and the unknown. It is an absolute act of rebellion in 2015 to be inefficient. And maybe it starts by washing your own dishes. Thank you very much.